All right, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, comrades and friends. Uh, there is a good uh, fantasy series called Chronicles of Amber, where uh, there is a real world, the true vivid world, uh, called Amber, and uh, there's an infinity of shadows, which are these dreamlike variations uh, on the real world. And uh, the princes of Amber have the power of walking in shadow, of uh, entering the shadow worlds uh, to gain some power or uh, wisdom or bring some plan to fruition. Uh, so I'm saying this because 50 years ago, uh, the quest of fundamental physics uh, of like, getting to the next layer of the laws of nature uh, has gotten a bit difficult for us. Uh, and uh, so uh, people like uh, Nick here and uh, myself uh, have been walking in shadow quite a lot and uh, studying imaginary universes. So uh, I think we might hear about a shadow or two today. Uh, so uh, uh, we are very happy to have uh, Nick Dory, who is uh, uh, professoring at Cambridge. Uh, if you don't know what Cambridge is, it's uh, kind of like Oxford, but good. Uh, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, Nick Dory, please. For that poetic introduction, uh, Yasha. Please use the microphones to ask questions. Um, it's fantastic to be here, here in Oist, and I want to start by thanking TSVP and everyone here who really their support um, for myself and my family has made this a fantastic visit so far. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about two different types of physical theory um, and how they're related to each other. One type of physical theory is um, the quantum field theories that we use to describe uh, particle physics. This is a snapshot from a numerical simulation of a quantum field theory. And the other type of theory um, is the theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of gravity and its cousins. And the fact that not so recently now, 25 years ago, a remarkable relation between these two types of theory was discovered by Juan Maldacena particularly, uh, with contributions from, from many other people also. And this is a really unexpected relation between two very different types of theory. And it's led to interesting insights about both. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that in the time that I have. And in fact, as I've indicated, much of what um, the ADS-CFT correspondence itself is certainly not, not, not new. And what I'll talk about goes back to the early days of the correspondence, but it's something that I've been revisiting in, in recent work. It's one of the oldest topics, black hole entropy. Um, and hopefully um, I'll be able to tell you a little bit about my own work to, towards the end. So before we start, a word or two about theories, which relates to some of what, what Yasha has said. I mean, first of all, what do we mean by a theory? So that in, in, in science in general, theory has has a meaning, but it has a more specific meaning when we talk about something like a, a quantum field theory. To first approximation, it's a set of physical rules that allow us to calculate all of the observable quantities relevant to that theory. In the case of a quantum field theory, it might be um, the rules for the scattering and masses of a bunch of particles. In the case of a theory of gravity, it might be um, the properties of black holes, the evolution of the universe as a whole. Now, <laughs> um, these theories, um, we try and construct them uh, by bringing the principles we know and love from the real world, the principles that we observe to be true in the real world, and we have a deep feeling should continue to be true in extensions of our knowledge, things like the principles of special relativity and the principles of quantum mechanics. So, for example, the fact that physics should be the same in all inertial reference frames, the basic principle of, uh, of, of relativity is something that we embed in these theories. Now, of course, we're interested in reproducing the real world, and quantum field theory has actually been very successful about that. But an important theoretical surprise that was that when we try and construct quantum field theories, theories that describe uh, particles interacting in a way which consistent with both quantum mechanics and relativity, just making them mathematically consistent 
turns out to be incredibly restrictive. And in retrospect, when we look at the standard model of particle physics, it turns out that nature selected a theory from a relatively small list of possible mathematical theories. Now that gives us as lice, theorists license to take this family of theories and investigate them as a whole. Some of the members of the theory of these families of theories don't look anything like the real world. We might add lots of extra particles and fields. We might add extra dimensions of space time and other things that sound exotic. But they're very highly constrained because they're one of the few solutions that we know of uh, that combines the principles, let's say, of, of relativity and, and quantum mechanics. So we can use these uh, theories, and that's very much the name of the game, to investigate the possibilities for possible physical worlds. Um, and hopefully in the case, as in the case of particle physics, nature has actually selected one of them. But generally we were interested in uh, asking more fundamental questions like which of the physical principles that we know and love are actually consistent with each other. And in the context of gravity and black holes and trying to make a quantum theory of gravity, there's a very basic question, which is whether the laws of quantum mechanics are consistent with um, the principles of uh, underlying general relativity. Um, and that's the kind of question that one can hope to answer in this rather formal setting. So that's sort of the, the meta description of what's going on in the subject that I, that I spend my time thinking about. So let's start with something very concrete. There's a theory in that sense, but it's also a theory of the real world, which is Einstein's uh, theory of gravity, general relativity, in which um, the old idea of a gravitational field is replaced by the idea that masses in space-time uh, lead to the curvature of space-time. The gravitational field is realized as the curvature of space-time. And Einstein's beautiful field equation has a, a left-hand side that encodes how space-time is curved and a right-hand side that, that encodes the, uh, the matter that you put into the space-time to do with gravity. So uh, the constant of proportionality involves Newton's constant and uh, relativity always involves the speed of light. In more poetic terms, GR is uh, basically described by John uh, Archibald Wheeler as saying that matter tells space how to curve. Uh, so a mass will curve the space time around it. And then in that curved space time, if we put um, objects, test particles into it, they will follow um, curves, de uh, paths determined by the curvature, the geodesics of that space time. So a beautiful classical theory. And one of the most striking theoretical predictions of Einstein's theory that was present right from the early days, almost immediately after he wrote the theory down, is the idea that if you take this curvature of space-time to its logical extreme, then there will be objects in the universe called black holes, which are regions of space-time where if you put enough mass in a small enough radius, you create a region where the curvature is so large that light and nothing else can escape. Now, black holes remained a theoretical possibility for a long time, but over the last few years, they've come, in terms of real physics, they've come very much to the forefront um, with the fact that we've really detected the signals of black holes directly um, in uh, experiments where we detect the gravitational radiation from black hole mergers at the LIGO interferometer. Um, and so they have a much more direct, at least to, to most people, they're, they're their reality is, is, uh, is far more definite than, uh, than it was before. So we have a very strong feeling that these, uh, these uh, objects are, are, are out there in the universe. And also um, the experiments allow us to test Einstein's general theory of relativity um, in new ways, which um, really confirm the fact that these black holes are described by GR. For the purpose of these theoretical inv investigations, um, a black hole, in general, in the real world is something uh, that might look kind of complicated because there's all the extraneous stuff to do with the various matter that's falling into the black hole, the accretion disk, um, and the possibility of particles uh, jetting out from the accretion disk and what are called relativistic jets, various astrophysical processes. But at the core, um, in terms of the solution of GR, the black hole has two features which um, we're gonna talk about in this talk. First of all, um, this region of space-time is surrounded by a surface um, called the event horizon from which nothing can escape. So a black hole to first approximation looks like a, a smooth black uh, sphere if it's not rotating. Um, 
with the uh, um, <coughs> uh, with the event horizon roughly as its outline, and um, the equations of GR, which are spectacularly verified, also predict their own downfall. Downfall in some sense. In the in the center of the black hole, as described by GR, there is a singularity, a point where this curvature of space time becomes infinite, uh, diverges, and if nothing else, we expect that once we approach that point, uh, Einstein's equations have to be replaced by something better um, involving the effects of quantum mechanics, because everything fluctuates if you go to small enough scales in our experience of the world so far. Okay, so if we take Einstein's theory, then black holes at their theoretical level are rather simple objects, simple universal objects, which is why theorists are so, so keen on them. Um, they are featureless black um, uh, bodies, if you like. Um, and the key thing is that all black holes, in some sense, look more or less the same. There are theorems that tell us about the solutions of Einstein's equations, at least in four dimensions, and tell us that the possible black holes that we can have are really few in number. They're characterized by just a few numbers, a few conserved quantities. Their mass, they can spin so they can have angular momentum, and they can carry an electric charge. This is somewhat poetically called the no hair theorem. The situation changes, though, as soon as we try and incorporate and reconcile the existence of these objects with um, the laws of quantum mechanics. The first step towards thinking about quantum gravity is to just consider the behavior of matter described by quantum mechanics in the vicinity of a black hole. And those are the, that's the investigation that Hawking started in the uh, 1970s and made a very striking discovery that black holes are not exactly black, but actually radiate like black bodies of a characteristic temperature. The temperature involves Planck's constant, indicating that this is very much a quantum effect. And in, this is the particular formula for the simplest non-spinning, um, non-charged black hole, the Schwarzschild solution. So black holes aren't black, they have a temperature. So in some sense, they're like hot bodies. Um, uh, and um, uh, in fact, when you combine that with earlier observations about black holes, um, then you discover that they that's not just it might just be an analogy, but it's at least a very, very precise analogy. In addition to a temperature, thermodynamic systems, which we describe um, um, by equilibrium, in, temperature refers to the phenomenon of thermodynamic equilibrium, um, uh, are characterized not just by their temperature, but also by having an entropy and a free energy, uh, which obey the laws of thermodynamics. And it was subsequently discovered that indeed black holes have these attributes also, that you can extend the analogy so that, in fact, I'm slightly achronological in my description here, but um, you can extend the analogy so that black holes really do behave like thermodynamic ensembles with a characteristic temperature, provided you ascribe to them also an entropy. And that entropy has the interesting pro property is that it's always proportional to the area of this surface that surrounds the black hole, the black hole horizon. Um, and once you make this identification, then black holes, in some sense, obey all the laws of thermodynamics. But this is where many, many puzzles about black holes start. Um, the fact that they really do radiate at a characteristic temperature suggests that this is more than an analogy, and that really we should think about this as a real entropy. But if we think about what we know about entropy in the context of statistical mechanics, that seems very strange and at odds with the nature of black holes. So uh, in general, um, uh, thermal systems, which we understand like hot gases, we have the fact that thermodynamics is a long wavelength, if you like, effective description or an average description of statistical mechanics. And Boltzmann was the first one to make the connection, um, which identifies the entropy as being proportional to the logarithm of the number of possible different configurations that the underlying system, whether it's atoms in a gas or, um, or um, other kinds of uh, thermal ensemble, the number of configurations or microstates, as it's called in the jargon, that that system can have. So we naturally associate an entropy with some possible degeneracy of possible configurations that that system can have. 
But in the case of a black hole, that's very odd because I've told you they're just described by uh, essentially three numbers. Indeed, this is the beginning of a long series of puzzles related to the thermodynamic behavior of black holes. First one we could ask based on that formula for the entropy is that if you take it seriously, then what are the configurations or microstates associated with a black hole? If we associate um, the entropy of a black hole given by Hawking's formula, um, and we associate it in the Boltzmann way with the logarithm of um, a degeneracy of states, then we discover a vast, unimaginably vast degeneracy of states for all realistic black holes. In particular, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, according to such a formula, has an unimaginably large number of, of, of microstates. So what are these? Um, the fact of Hawking radiation, the fact that uh, if you allow Hawking radiation to proceed, the black hole will lose energy and mass and eventually evaporate, presumably to nothing, um, also raises many questions. Uh, questions that really pit quantum mechanics against gravity. So in particular, one can ask if the black hole evaporates to, to nothing, um, what happens to all the information about all the stuff that fell into the black hole? We could have dropped all kinds of books and movies and uh, information content into the black hole and it disappears. You may not care about that, but quantum mechanics does. Quantum mechanics, the basic laws of quantum mechanics, one way of rephrasing them, roughly speaking, is to say that information is never uh, created nor destroyed. So in fact, there are sharp contradictions between um, uh, quantum mechanics and um, general relativity, which come about as soon as you start to think about uh, the process of black hole evaporation. And physicists have been wondering about this ever since um, uh, uh, Hawking's initial paper. And uh, uh, it's something that theorists, it's a theorist puzzle par excellence that um, uh, really uh, a lot of people have devoted a lot of time to thinking about. Um, we can also go back to thinking about the singularity at the center of the black hole, the fact that we expect things to fluctuate once we get to very small length scales. So we should also expect to have an answer of if we had a complete theory, including quantum mechanics, what replaces the singularity of the black hole? So these are all questions which in principle would be answered by um, a fully quantum theory of gravity, something that in the real world we don't have at this point. We have a bunch of proposals, if you like. We have various theoretical ways of investigating um, the, um, the prospects uh, of a consistent theory, but we don't have a fully functioning real world theory of quantum gravity. Part of the reason is that we have very few experimental clues. The effects of quantum gravity are characterized by this quantity, the Planck length. Numerically, this is hugely small. It's 10 to the minus 35 meters. So the characteristic effects of quantum gravity are outside the reach of almost all possible conceivable uh, experimental, um, experimental investigations. Maybe something to do with the early universe uh, will tell us something about quantum gravity. Maybe there are some things we can learn indirectly. Um, but black holes provide an important theoretical laboratory in which to test our ideas, because any functioning theory of quantum gravity should come with some answers to these questions. And it's in that spirit that I'm going to describe some of the, the developments from the last, um, the last few years. So if we focus on this issue of black hole entropy, we can pinpoint something um, that's a puzzle, but one can also regard as a, a clue to what a theory of quantum gravity might actually look like. So I gave you Boltzmann's formula, which says that uh, the entropy of a system is proportional to the logarithm of the number of configurations. And I told you that for black holes, it's proportional to the area of the event horizon. That's extremely puzzling. Um, the main reason it's puzzling is that in almost all our experience of the theories that we're used to, gases, quantum field theories, whatever you like, solids, um, in all conventional theories, entropy has the property of being extensive. It's proportional to the volume of the system, not to an area. Um, at a basic level, how we model uh, solids, for example, or indeed quantum field theories, when we resolve down and perhaps put them on a, on a lattice to, to regulate things, is there's a bunch of degrees of freedom attached to each point in space. And um, roughly speaking, the number of configurations the system can have is related to the configurations of the degrees of freedom at each point in space. 
So for example, in this simplified picture, we have n spins, which can be either up or down, sitting at the points of a two-dimensional grid. Um, and that means that there are roughly two to the n possible configurations of the system. n is proportional to the volume if we distribute them at regular, uh, regular spacings here. So in this case, we see an example of a system that is extensive. Its entropy will go like the logarithm of w. In other words, it will be linear in n and therefore proportional to the volume. And that's absolutely um, characteristic of all of the systems which we uh, have studied in, in physics before gravity. So um, this is really one of the unusual features of, um, uh, of black hole entropy. The fact is that the entropy, even allowing for the presence of, Planck, of uh, Boltzmann's constant in here, is not proportional to the volume, but it's rather proportional to the area surrounding the black hole. Indeed, more precisely, it's precisely that area calculated in units of the Planck length scale, that tiny length scale associated with quantum gravity. So the huge numbers um, that I described for astrophysical black holes can be thought of as the number of units of Planck area uh, in the black hole horizon. So this is um, a statement that basically gravity cannot be a conventional theory of the type we're used to, at least in the usual way of ascribing local degrees of freedom to each point in space-time. And um, some people took that as, um, as a clue for how to proceed. And in particular, um, very early uh, ideas by Toft and uh, also by Suskind, uh, long before this was made concrete, um, developed the idea that this is a really important clue about quantum gravity. Subsequent developments, in fact, they've even been filled in further by the ADS-CFT correspondence, make it clear that gravity, um, it's not just the interior of black holes, it's other regions of space-time that obey have this feature, that they have an entropy which is associated not to their volume, but to the area of the surface surrounding. So um, in general, um, we cannot say that uh, the interior is described by some local theory with degrees of freedom at each point in um, in space-time. Um, instead, another possibility is that instead somehow gravity is encoded in a more conventional theory which lives on the boundary of the region of space-time. This is called the holographic principle because it describes how a higher dimensional picture or image or space in this case is encoded in a, a lower dimensional boundary in this case. So the idea of encoding a three-dimensional picture in a, a two-dimensional plane is what we normally call hol hol uh, holography. So this is holography in the context of, of gravity. So this, for a long time, was basically a, um, a kind of a wish for what the theory of quantum gravity would like, but it became very, very concrete about 20, 25 years ago with a very specific proposal, which turned out to generalize in nice ways, not yet in directions that encompass the real world, for what exactly the theory should be on the boundary of space-time. So Maldacena proposed something that works not in our universe, um, but in which has, we think, positive curvature, a positive cosmological constant, but works very nicely and best in universes with a, a negative curvature or negative cosmological constant. So the space-like slices are spaces of hyperboloids, spaces of negative curvature. There's still spaces designed by, it's still a theory described by Einstein's equations, it's just they have a cosmological constant term in them, which is negative, unlike the one in the real world. Um, and in general, we are also usually thinking about dozens of Einstein's theories in which we add more fields, and perhaps also think about black holes and other objects in higher space-time dimensions, not just in, in four dimensions, but within this general idea of exploring the possibilities um, for physical theories that embody the principles that we want. So he proposed that quantum gravity in anti de Sitter space, that's the, uh, that's the uh, space-time of constant negative curvature, that's the vacuum of the space-time, if you like, and then you add curvature from if you place masses in, inside it, um, is equivalent to some quantum field theory on the boundary. And he made a specific proposal for what that quantum field theory should be. In uh, the basic case, it's a conformally invariant quantum field theory, we think about it as living on the boundary of uh, the anti-de-sitter space, um, uh, uh, which has one higher dimension. 
So it's a, a realization of this holographic printable of Poft, Poft and Susskind. So this is an interesting theoretical idea, and I'm going to flesh it out a little bit more to describe what's on both sides. Um, and I'll also see how I'm doing for time. Um, reasonably, but not great. Um, <laughs> so it's an, it's, a, it's an idea for an exact equivalence. It's a very bold um, statement because it's a statement of the exact equivalence of two things, uh, which we can calculate in different ways, um, some of which overlap. So it's a contentful and, and predictive statement that a theory of gravity, including quantum gravity, in D space-time dimensions should be equivalent to a particular boundary theory of a more conventional type, a quantum field theory without gravity, living in one less space-time dimension. And in the rest of the talk, I'll keep D as the volume of what we call the bulk, that's the, the big space where gravity lives, and D minus one is the dimension of the boundary, the boundary of that space. So somehow the whole of physics of quantum gravity has to be encoded in something lower dimensional. Now, one of the clues for how that works, roughly speaking, uh, I'll give you here because it will come back again, is clearly the extra space, sorry, the, uh, the, the bulk space has one more dimension than the boundary. It has the extra coordinate which runs um, normal, to the, normal to the boundary. So um, a clue about how the degrees of freedom of the bulk theory are encoded in the boundary is roughly the following that objects of characteristic scale size rho on the boundary correspond to point-like objects in the bulk, but a distance rho into the interior. And if you want to describe non-point-like in in, uh, objects in the bulk, you have to work harder and uh, superimpose uh, different point-like objects. Um, so one of the clues about how this holography or ADS-CFT correspondence works is that the extra dimension in the gravitational theory is something to do with scaling in the bulk, changing the scale size uh, on, the, on, sorry, on the boundary of, of space-time in the space-time description. Now, what does this boundary description look, look like and what does it bias? So again, I'm gonna assume that um, uh, perhaps, and this is not an accurate assumption for many of the people I see in the audience, that perhaps you're not familiar with field theory. So I'll introduce its simplest exemplar, which is Maxwell's theory of electricity and magnetism. So a field theory is something where we associate physical degrees of freedom, as I said, to each point in space and time. In the case of Maxwell's theory, that's an electric field and a magnetic field. Those are vector fields which live at a point in space and they also vary in time. Now, the kind of theories we're interested in here, which are also very important in particle physics, are basically generalizations of Maxwell's theory, in which we take these vectors and we take each component of the vector and replace it by a matrix. So it's still a vector, but now it's a vector of n by n matrices. And in the principle of sort of exploring the full space of possibilities, we regard n as a parameter. Uh, and different values of n are relevant to the real world, as we'll discuss in a minute. So um, one can generalize Maxwell's theory in a fairly unique way to matrix valued fields. Um, it leads to a theory called Yang-Mills theory, which I can describe if I just briefly tell you uh, in relativistic notation that we package the electric and magnetic fields into a larger object or the field strength tensor, also a matrix, now a four by four matrix in the space-time indices. And basically we're talking about a generalization in which each component here becomes an n by n matrix. And so we get a, a, field, a matrix field strength tensor. And Maxwell's equations that tell us how electric and magnetic fields evolve in the presence of um, external charges, for example, or actually in the vacuum in this case, um, are replaced by uh, an equation called the Yang-Mills equation, a matrix second order partial differential equation, um, which I can write in abbreviated form in terms of the field strength tensor in this way. So um, this is um, part of the proposal for the theory that lives on the boundary. Um, so this, um, the actual boundary theory that Maldacena proposed consists of these n by n gauge fields which generalize Maxwell's theory. Um, and also in order, to, um, in order to have the right theory that has the right properties in particular conformal invariance, 
you need a bunch of other fields, which make this very unlike um, the field theories that we deal with um, uh, in the real world of particle physics. But in some sense, they're close cousins because they're gauge theories. The theories of the standard model of particle physics are non-abelian gauge theories, roughly corresponding to two by two and three by three matrices. So here we're considering a more general member of this class of theory in which we have extra particles and we have a larger gauge group, in other words, larger matrices. And the proposal is that um, from this theory, which in principle we can calculate with, in practice, life is always much more difficult, but in principle we can calculate, if we take a limit in which the dimension of the matrices become large, and moreover, a limit which is very different from the classical limit where things are described by um, the Yang-Mills equation, then gravity should emerge and everything with it, black holes and all the phenomena of gravity, at least in the negatively curved universe should emerge. So it's a remarkable statement. And uh, it's truly amazing the amount of interest and activity this statement, this conjecture, uh, generated over the last 25 years. Um, a huge amount of evidence has been formulated on both sides of a real wide variety of types. And I'll finish my talk basically by talking about uh, a little bit of the evidence um, that this is really a true statement in the context of the theories we're talking about, and that it generalizes to big classes of theories. And maybe it's even relevant for the real world, but we don't quite know yet, mainly because of the problem I alluded to, a positive cosmological constant. Um, so um, it's a remarkable statement, which is possible to test and has provided many, many tests have actually been performed. But it's important to say that testing it because it's clearly not an obvious statement. The fact that a lower dimensional theory can look like a higher dimensional theory with gravity. So it doesn't appear in the, in the regime we're used to working. It appears in this strong coupling regime where quantum effects are large. So the challenge of understanding and testing ADS-CFT is to take quantum field theory into this regime of strong coupling. It's also a very relevant challenge for the real world where we need to understand strongly coupled field theory to account for the fact, for example, that quarks are confined inside hadrons. So there's a huge challenge here, but also opportunity because um, it provides new insight. This duality provides a way, a completely new way of framing hard problems on one or either side of the correspondence in terms of the other side. So in particular, uh, we can put black holes into anti de Sitter space and um, think about their Hawking radiation and their evolution and all these problems and ask, what does that look like in the boundary theory? We can also turn it the other way around and think about hard problems in quantum field theory, like the one that I just, uh, just alluded to, the fact that quarks are confined inside hadrons. And at least in a slightly more generalized context, try and understand um, what this confinement looks like from the point of view of a dual gravitational theory. And that's another story which I won't have time to talk about today. OK, so um, in general, it's hard to test. And in general, you have to take field theory and extrapolate it to strong coupling, um, which is hard. But fortunately for us, there are a few things that you can calculate, a few stable things that you can calculate in these theories, uh, which you can calculate classically. and um, there are arguments for these special theories that they can be continued to strong coupling and compared with the gravity regime. And so I'm going to tell you about one of these things, um, which provides a really nice test, um, I think, of the physics of ADS-CFT in the context of black holes. So we can start on one side of the correspondence with classical field theory. If we take um, the theory on the, the boundary, um, far away from the regime of gravity, is described by solutions of a nonlinear matrix differential equation. And one of the first questions you can ask is what the space of such solutions look like. Now, because of the connections of this theory to uh, the real world and particle physics, this is a question that was studied extensively by mathematicians in the 1970s and also by physicists. And there is a really comprehensive set of answers for what all of the solutions to this equation, or at least those solutions which have the property of having, um, if I'm slightly poetic, I'll call it finite energy. I really mean finite action in this context, but in a related context, it's really finite energy. Um, essentially, the full set of solutions can be described. 
they're split up into different sectors classified by the way that the fields wind round as we go through space, the way they wind round in the field space, in this space of n by n matrices. And so um, something I have to introduce is called the topological winding number, tells us how many of these, uh, well, I'll tell you how many of what in a minute, but it's something that characterizes these solutions. It's integer valued, it's something you can calculate if you know the solution, and it always comes out as an integer. So the space of solutions splits up according to this integer called the winding number. And we know um, in both physical and mathematical terms what these solutions look like. Um, from the physical description, we can find spaces of solutions which corresponds to lumps of energy or action density, depending on your perspective, lumps of the field which live centered at different points in space time. They have, because of the scale invariance of Yang Mills theory, they have um, a characteristic center in space time, but they also have a characteristic size, which you can vary. So there's actually a high dimensional space of these solutions. And when the winding number is K, it means you have K of these lumps. They look like individual lumps when they're far apart. The story is much more complicated when they come together, but mathematicians managed to describe that exactly. They managed to find the general solution. Atia and collaborators in the 1970s wrote down an algorithm to describe the general solution. And they were able uh, to really describe in some detail the space of all solutions to these equations. The ADHM moduli space, as it's called, it has high dimension, um, which involves both the, uh, the n by n matrices that I talked about in formulating the theory and the winding number, and also, it's a very, very complicated space in topological terms. It has lots of handles and holes um, and um, things which uh, mathematicians and topologists love. This is not the ADHM moduli space. It's just a picture of a, a suitably topologically complicated manifold. So this is not meant to be an actual depiction in any sense. So what has this got to do with ADS-CFT? Well, some properties of these instantons, at least when they contribute to certain observables and uh, I won't have time in this, this talk to go into much more detail than that, can be tracked from weak coupling to, small, to strong coupling. And indeed, some of the characteristic features of the holography of the ADH-CFT correspondence are realized very directly in terms of instantons. Instantons are lumps with a fixed scale size in, on the boundary. So according to the holographic principle, they should correspond to localized objects at a fixed distance, depending on their size, from the boundary in the bulk. And something that was done quite soon after the ADS-CFT correspondence arrived um, was to show that this is really works in detail, that the contributions of instantons in this particular gauge theory really look like the contributions of point-like objects in anti de Sitter space. And you can actually calculate some things and compare them to other things, um, the corresponding things on the bulk side of the correspondence and find an exact match. So that's actually an old story. Um, but now it's got a newer twist, um, which again is something there's a lot of previous work uh, relevant to, but I'll just talk about the recent developments from this point of view. Um, so in particular, the fact that we, that uh, instantons behave like massive point particles in a particular sense inside ADS means that we can use them to investigate black holes. So in particular, we can take um, a bunch of these instantons, which means winding number K, put them into a configuration where um, there's a lot of mass in a small radius in the bulk. And then if we really do have um, a theory of quantum gravity, they should form, a, or a theory of classical gravity even, they should form a black hole. And um, according to ADS-CFT, the entropy of that black hole should have something to do with the set of possible configurations of this family of solutions. And again, not everything can be continued from strong coupling to weak coupling. Um, so we can't always compare classical gauge theory with classical gravity or something close to classical gravity. But um, in this case, um, uh, in fact, it turns out to be one of the things that we can compare. So this is a, quite an old story in a general context, but it's got a very new twist um, to do with understanding the physics of black holes in anti de Sitter space um, when the bulk dimension is um, either the physical dimension, which is four, or higher in some cases. A lot was known in physical dimension three, 
um, from the early days of ADS CFT, but it's only really been developed more generally. So the basic computation that can be done to count the states which these instanton forms, roughly speaking, it corresponds to counting in a, an appropriate weighted way all the handles and holes in this manifold of solutions. And this is something you can do with the ADHM construction. You can use the ADHM construction to calculate a topological invariant, which counts the handles and holes in this surface. And in some, in some sense, you're counting um, the states which are dual to the black hole in the field theory, in the, um, from the field theory point of view. Um, a recent calculation which builds on a theme that people have studied for a long time, but is new in the context of these higher dimensional ADS black holes, is that you can really complete that calculation and take the weighted Euler character of the ADHM moduli space of instanton solutions, find its asymptotics, and really compare it to the area of a horizon of a black hole in, um, in anti de Sitter space. There is lots of relevant previous work but most of it uh, refers to black holes in uh, lower dimensional ADS spaces. It's only relatively recently that people started to understand how the matching works for um, black holes in um, um, higher dimensional bulks. And in particular, um, in this case, where we have a direct relation to four dimensional gauge theory on the boundary, which I can describe in more detail if anyone's interested. So the computation tells us that something mathematicians calculated a long time ago in its asymptotics um, really matches some a function you calculate by calculating the area of the solution of Einstein's equations in anti de space. So that's the, the main result. So just to finish, and I don't know how much time I have. Oh, okay, I'm not doing too badly. Well, I guess I'm, I've got a, a few minutes, five minutes or something. Yeah, okay. <laughs> So I kind of rushed through that, that last part, but um, um, that, that leads me on to um, what can we actually do? What are the long-term prospects for this field? Which I haven't prepared a lot to say about, um, but perhaps I'll just say some, some general things, which I think are, are very promising. So again, it's important to emphasize that ADS-CFT is essentially a proposal for what quantum gravity is. And at the moment, it's really a proposal of what quantum gravity is in the context of these strange universes with negative curvature and usually with more, more or less space time dimensions than what we're used to. You can do a four dimensional one, but really we're investigating it at the level of this general class of theories. We don't know yet now how to, to apply it to the universe that, um, uh, that we live in. Uh, although many people, including Yasha here, are doing amazing work in, in exploring that direction. Um, but despite that, these theories have Einstein's equations. They have black holes. They embody all the principles that we know and love from um, uh, gravity in the real world. They have Hawking radiation. The black holes decay. They even look almost exactly like flat space black holes if you make them small enough. So if you can really understand this setup, you can at least answer the questions about whether there can be a consistent theory which combines gravity and quantum mechanics and how it resolves the problems associated with uh, black holes. We're nowhere near that now, but there's the prospect that we might get closer to it. So in order to do that, one needs to calculate not just these very special stable things that people have been working on for uh, the last 25 years, and of which the work that I told you is kind of a, a recent twist, we need to be able to calculate much more generic things. We need to, to make a black hole, watch it Hawking radiate, and watch it disappear, and see what happens in some sense. And that, of course, is very hard. So that, basically, the way you would hope to do that is by, we, can, we know, roughly speaking, how to formulate the boundary theories in some cases. We can write them down. In some cases, they're just simple quantum mechanics, although they have many degrees of freedom. So in principle, we know what to do. We can take quantum mechanics and simulate it. It's too hard to solve analytically, but in principle, for certain observables, for example, we can do Monte Carlo simulations. And there's been a lot of um, slow but, but reasonable progress towards providing tests, broader classes of tests of ADS-CFT using Monte Carlo simulation of the boundary theory to verify some of the 
basic properties of black holes in the bulk. But there are only very, very few um, types of um, observable that are amenable to Monte Carlo simulation. It's really only certain things that you can get your hands on um, because you have to use a Euclidean formulation, basically, and calculate correlation functions in some sense. Um, so uh, the current state of the art is that, for example, things like how the entropy of the black hole scales for a, a more realistic black hole, which has non-zero temperature, um, that can be reproduced roughly to about 10% using simulations of the boundary theory. So that's a comparison of, of classical gravity in this um, Einstein-like theory on one side with a numerical simulation on the other. The prospects for the future, um, at least in one respect, look bright. Quantum computing um, has been on the horizon for a long time, and there are many debates about how useful it's going to be for real-world applications. But one thing it should be good for, if it's feasible at all, is simulating quantum systems. Basically, um, it's more or less mocking up or emulating the particular quantum system that you're interested in. In this case, it would be the quantum mechanics of the boundary theory. So although the accuracy uh, would require a vast quantum computer even already to get this kind of 10% agreement, um, uh, to repeat the simulations, the simulation accuracy of Monte Carlo, a recent estimate suggested, suggests that a quantum cube computer to simulate a black hole would need about 7,000 logical qubits. Um, but of course, that situation is sort of rapidly evolving in the sense that the number of qubits that are available seems to, it seems to be increasing. So perhaps it's not something that's out of the realms of, of future possibility. Um, and the exciting thing is not that we could do better than this 10%, but that quantum simulation really allows you in principle to access the full information about the quantum state of the system. It's a simulation basically in which you set up the quantum state and in principle you could measure or less anything. I don't know in practice what such a thing would look like, but it seems that um, the ADSC correspondence and uh, uh, the prospect of, of actually examining what happens to a black hole in anti visitor space is one that on our longer term horizon is something that could be investigated in more detail. So I think that's an optimistic note on, on which to end. Thank you very much. Questions? Use a microphone, signal your virtue. Okay, question. So, uh, chairman's duty. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, how do we go actually from uh, instant on, which is zero dimensional in space time, to a black hole that is one dimensional in space time? Uh, well, because secretly I'm really talking about instant ons in five dimensional gauge theory. Five-dimensional gauge theory is um, uh, the low energy effective theory of the two comma zero superconformal field theory. So it's a, the setup for ADS7, which the boundary theory is six-dimensional. Um, and there's a particular limit in which um, you can isolate the quantum mechanics on the instant on moduli space, and you can isolate the dual black hole. It's called an ultra-spinning black hole. So in our recent papers, we show that uh, the ultra spinning limit of an anti de Sitter black hole in ADS-7 is dual to quantum mechanics on the instant on moduli space. Not just at the level of, um, of uh, BPS quantities, but this actually should be an honest duality. Um, of course, the only things we can calculate at the moment are the BPS things. Um, but if you take, take the argument starting from um, the basic Maldacena setup for ADS7, you can take this limit on both sides and argue that one side leads you directly to quantum mechanics of instantons, and the other side leads you to um, uh, leads you to this ultra-spinning limit of the black hole that's been studied in GR. So there really is a holographic setting in which um, it's the quantum mechanics of instantons that's relevant for uh, for black hole entropy. So that that's the new the new part of the work essentially. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I think you mentioned that a lot of the theory has been developed in anti-desitter space. 
and there's new developments in positive curvature space time. So are we interested in flat cosmologies at all? Um, I think flat cosmologies we're definitely interested in. Um, I think there've also been, you know, there's a huge development trying to understand ads -CFT flat space. Celestial holography, for example, is a, is a big subject. Um, and in general, the problem is that for anti dissider space, the dual theory is something we recognize. It's a conformal field theory that obeys the axioms that we associate with the usual um, quantum field theories. It has properties like unitarity, for example. It's possible to imagine um, setups in which there's a boundary. Of course, there's a boundary for de Sitter space. There's a boundary scry minus and scry plus flat space. But the conformal field theory that lives there, if it's dual to the bulk in those cases, must have more exotic properties. I think it's fair to say that no one has really constructed a working example. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm going to wait to be overruled by Yasha if he wants to overrule me on that. Um, a completely compelling working example. Would you, would you, do you have anything to add to that? Spelling then, of course. Yeah, not. I, I thought I'd put <laughs> that in as a... <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but, but maybe a relevant thing to say, though like not at all directly related to the talk uh, uh, about uh, flat space time is that, so a, so ADS CFT in some sense resolved the uh, the puzzle of Hawking uh, evaporation of black holes and what happens to radiation and what uh, sorry, what happens to the information uh, when they uh, radiate away. And uh, recently there has been good progress about the harder version of this question, which is in flat space time. So uh, people uh, got better at tracking what happens to the information there. So yeah, we, we care about flat space time still. 